normally I try and cram this into 40 minutes and it's a bit speedy so I'll, I'll go a little slower tonight uh, as we've got sort of more an open session there's not another speaker on after so uh, be a bit more laid back tonight um, but that's all the usual blurb about me the only thing really of interest on there is my Twitter handle uh, Mark I Allison that's with a capital I and two L's in Allison if anyone wants to follow me on Twitter I will be live tweeting while I'm presenting tonight so there will be links to various subjects that we're talking about tonight and uh, so yeah if you follow the Twitter stream you should uh, get all that if I'm still connected to the Wi-Fi um, so yeah that's the, the Twitter so we're going to talk about vector drawables uh, can I just have a quick show of hands? Who uh, who actually uses vector drawables? That's good. There's a, a, a good few of you. Um, for those that don't, uh, just a little bit of background. Vector drawables are a declarative form of uh, graphics. They use SVG path data. So if, any, if you're familiar with SVG, they, they actually uh, are very, very close neighbours with SVG. And so they're really compact, and they, uh, they, they basically give a series of commands that get rendered at runtime. And in Android, they were introduced in Lollipop in API 21. Um, and everyone was happy because they were a really good thing. But there were a few problems with them. There, there were a few bugs, there were a few omissions. And there's quite a lot happened since then, because 21 was released a few years ago now. And that's really what we're going to talk about in this talk, uh, is what's changed since API 21. Some of the new features that have come in, some of the bugs that have been fixed, and some of the gotchas. Um, one big change is Vector Studio. So Vector Studio is part of Android Studio, and it's how you import uh, vectors. You can import directly from an SVG file. And when they, it was first introduced, it really wasn't very good. Um, and you talk to the people that worked on it at Google, and I think they're the first to admit that. But it has improved enormously. So if anyone tried it back then and thought, well, this is useless, and I'm not going to ever use it again, give it another try now, because it's pretty good. Uh, it's. I tried a really, really complex file a couple of weeks ago um, that uh, even... Uh, Sketch and uh, Affinity Designer struggled to import as an SVG because it had some really complex layering. And Android Studio wasn't perfect, but it did as well as those two professional graphics packages. So it really has come a long way, so it's worth using. And this was another great point for me in uh, support library 23.2.0, it got added to the support library, so we had support library support. There is a big push by Google at the moment to uh, convince people that if you ever see uh, any framework APIs which are also uh, rolled out into a support library, the support library is the way to go because framework gets updated a couple of times a year. Support libraries, they can push out much more frequently. Some of the things that we're going to cover in here, if you're still uh, running code on devices running API 21, you're going to hit problems if you're using the framework version because they still have older versions of the framework code. If you switch to the support library, you will get all these bug fixes for free and they get fixed much more frequently. So. The big takeaway from this take talk, if you do nothing else, is use the support library. Um, we may be uh, coming back to that later on. So the first thing we're going to start with is fill windings. Uh, does anyone know what fill windings are? Wow, that's good. <laughs> that means I don't need to skip over this bit. Um, fill windings uh, are... Uh, a real, th I had a real gotcha uh, a couple of years back. Uh, I got a design for, or uh, an SVG file from a designer, and um, I 
checked it out, it looked great in Sketch, it looked great when you opened it up in Chrome, import it as a, a vector drawable, and it looked rubbish. Um, and it turned out that it was all down to these pesky things called fill windings. So hopefully if no one here actually knows what these are, you may recognize something in here that when you hit a problem similar to this, you think, oh, I know what this is. That's what that English bloke talked about. <laughs> um, and uh, you at least will know that there is quite an easy solution. So let's talk about what they are. Here are two shapes. They are actually identical. The only difference between those is fill windings. Um, now, you probably don't believe me, uh, but on, the, uh, on the, the, the left we have a blob, and on the right we have a donut. The design I got from the designer was more like the donut. The way it rendered once I created a vector drawable was like the blob. And I saw this and I said, well, I want a donut. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. That's not the first time that bloke said that. <laughs> um, but this was trying to get my head around what was causing this. So the first thing to do is actually look at the vector drawables uh, for both of those different shapes. Here's the code. They're pretty much identical. If we actually overlay the two code snippets, there's only one bit that's actually different. And you can see, because you can't read it in the top one, it's this fill type. You've got non-zero and even odd. And that is what these fill winding things are. So what actually do they do? A fill winding or a fill rule is a rule by which any pixel within the canvas is determined to be inside or outside the path. So when we fill that path, it's whether it gets painted with fill color or not. Simple as that. And there's two different uh, rules for how we can determine that. So let's start by looking at even odd. First, we need to understand how this path is drawn. It's a composite path. It consists of two separate path elements in this case, two separate circles. The first one is this outer circle, which is, has a radius of 49 pixels and is being drawn in an anti-clockwise direction, as is shown there. And that is that highlighted line. Now, I won't go into that in detail. We'll talk a little bit more about curves in a bit. The second circle is a smaller one that is positioned inside. So you can see quite clearly how we should be able to get a donut shape from that. So let's look at how the even odd fill winding rule works. So if we pick a pixel, say right in the middle, where that dot is, the way we can determine using the even odd rule whether that pixel is inside or outside the path, and so should be painted green or not, is we draw a line, an imaginary line. We start, imagine we're starting at that pixel and we start walking to the edge of the canvas. And what we do is we need to count how many times we cross the path. So in this case, we'll just walk uh, as though we're going east from there. So we hit the inner circle and we count one. We then keep going, we hit the outer circle, we hit we count two then we get to the edge of the canvas because we don't cross the path any more times and so we've crossed the path twice you might begin to guess how even odd works now because that's an even number this falls outside the path uh, so when we come to paint that this won't be painted green if however we start at a position between the two circles, like this. If we go this way, we cross the path once, that's an odd number, before we hit the edge. So an odd number is inside the path, so this pixel will be painted. 
And just to prove that it doesn't matter which direction we travel, if we were to go the other way from here, we cross the path once, twice, three times before we hit the canvas. That's still an odd number, so it's still inside. So it really doesn't matter which direction we go. And by all means, have a think about this afterwards, and uh, you, know, you can try any one you want, and the rule works quite nicely. So when we apply that, we can see we get everything rendered as a donut because everything that falls inside the inner circle has a, uh, a count of two and so is outside and not filled, so not painted green. That's the basics of uh, a fill winding. That is how the even odd rule works. And this was the root of the problem, that the... Uh, the uh, graphic I was getting from Sketch was using the even odd rule, and there was a bug in Android. Well, it wasn't such a, so much of a bug, it was a, an omission. And uh, when I actually uh, spoke about this in Chicago last week, um, right down near the front was a chap called John Hoford. Um, now, for those that don't know John's name, John is one of the guys that works on constraint layout. Um, and John is a great guy. Uh, he's a, a really lovely guy, uh, and he's incredibly uh, smart. Uh, he really makes me feel um, completely inadequate every time I talk to him, because he's just so clever. Um, and in a previous life, he actually worked on vector drawables. And uh, he told me uh, a while back that the, uh, uh, this was something that he really, really pained him quite deeply, because he had all the code in place to implement fill windings for API 21. And there was just a placeholder. He had everything in, in place to pass it down to Skia, which is the graphics rendering, ren rendering engine which uh, Android sits on top of. Everything was there. It just needed wiring up. And uh, he left the team to start working on constraint layout, and no one picked it up, and it got released without fill windings being properly implemented. And we got all these kinds of problems. So let's think about the other rule, which is non-zero. Now here, the direction of the paths is important. So remember back to when we saw the two circles being drawn. They were both being drawn in an anti-clockwise direction. And what we do is if we walk the same imaginary line, when we come to the, the, each path, imagine that we're crossing a one-way street. We know that the cars are going to come from one direction or the other. Uh, it's a one-way street, so they won't be coming both directions. But when we hit the cars coming in a counterclockwise direction across <coughs> us, in this case, so they would be coming from uh, right to left, we will increment a counter, so we'll add one. And when we cross the traffic coming the other direction, we decrement the counter, so we subtract one. And so here we hit the first path, we add one. We hit the second path, we add another one. So we get two. And then we hit the edge of the canvas. So we've got a count of two here. The name of the rule is non-zero. Two is non-zero. So that means this pixel falls inside the path, so it will be painted green. And that's why we get this shape filled in. So the easy solution to this problem is, ah, let's just change Android to use even odd. But as I just explained, they forgot, which means we've got something of a problem. Um, but there is actually an easy solution to this. Uh, it's because it's all about the directions of this. And uh, I had a very, very patient designer at the time who was happy to keep uh, tinkering with stuff uh, after I said, look, could you just try this and try that? And he was very, really, really patient, and uh, despite me asking some really daft things of him. Um, and uh, I, I went back to him, and I said, could you possibly reverse the direction of that in a path? So it goes like this. And so when we go from that middle point, this is now crossing uh, from right to left, so we decrement the counter, so we go minus one here, 
Then we hit the outer path, which is going in the other direction, so we increment the counter, so we get to zero, and then we hit the edge of the canvas. So now we're zero, and this same shape, just by reversing the direction of the inner circle, we get our donut. Yay! I finally got my donut. <laughs> so in summary, the, we only had non-zero supported in API 21, which was painful, and the solution was to go and get designers to change things around. Fill type and even odd were finally actually added in API 24. So if you're 24 and later, you can just go and change the fill type and everything will work. Great. But they were added to the support library in 26.0.0. So what was that phrase I said earlier? <laughs> Use the support library. <laughs> if you use the support library, you will get the ability to toggle fill windings backwardly compatible. Um, so there is a real potential gotcha there, but if ever you see some weird uh, fill rendering, try tinkering with the, the, the fill types and you might find it just automatically looks good. But actually, as you import, uh, SVGs, it will pick up the fill winding rule from the SVG path data and it will usually pick the correct one, so you may, may never see this. But you now know about it anyway. So the next thing we're going to talk about is inline complex XML resources. That's really snappy. <laughs> Particularly as it's something which is due to, to uh, make things uh, easier to manage. Um, yeah. Go figure. Um, this is actually a lot simpler than it, it sounds. Um, when vectors were first launched, we also had this sister uh, uh, type called animated vector drawable. And they do pretty much what the name suggests. They're like vector drawables, only they're animated. Um, so yeah. Um, and what you had to do was it usually required a minimum of three files. Well, it always required a minimum of three files. The first thing you had was the vector itself. So this is a vector drawable for that little square. Um, and in there you have various parameters. Uh, the next thing you had was an animator file. So this is just a standard uh, uh, Android object animator, which allows you to animate a, a property on an object. And here we're going to just animate the, uh, the fill alpha. So we're going to change the, the opacity of this shape. And then you need a third file, which is the animated vector drawable. And this is essentially a mapping, which uh, at the top, uh, it takes a drawable, which is the drawable we looked at. Uh, and then it has a target, which uh, associates an animator with a particular element within that drawable. So it creates these mappings. So where there's one parameter, one animator, uh, there are three files. And the general rule is for each different uh, property that we animate, there's that number of properties plus two files needed for this. Um, and that's what's needed just to create that simple uh, fade in, fade out animation that we have there. And these can get a bit more complex. I mean, if anyone uh, wants to come chat with me later, I can show you some examples that are a bit more complex than this. Uh, but yeah, uh, you can do some pretty amazing stuff with them. But that's the basics. Um, and it can get quite difficult to maintain if you have to have a load of separate files. And inline complex XML resources are a way of just inlining things. Um, and they work like this. So. At the top, we, this is exactly the same thing, um, but first we have to uh, have a different namespace in there. This is AAPT, uh, and if you're familiar with the build tools, you might recognize that as part of the build process. AAPT stands for uh, Android uh, Asset. Asset Packaging Tool, which again, rolls off the tongue Beautifully, um, uh, so easy to remember. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's uh, Mark's drinking game, is when you uh, want a, a, a way of uh, a group of you getting drunk, 
What you do is you time how long it takes each of you to say uh, Android asset packaging tool 10 times quickly. <laughs> Whoever says it the quickest has to chug their beer. And then you keep going. So the pe people that start off the best at it quickly get very bad at it. And it becomes its own built-in handicap system. So uh, if anyone wants to come for beers later, we'll, we'll have a few rounds of it. But um. So AAPT is the part of the build process that builds all your resources. It converts your XML resources into binary XMLs, and it builds your list of IDs and assumes you, uh, assu uh, ensures that you don't have any duplicate IDs and all of this kind of good stuff. Um, uh, and we can actually leverage this here. And this is what uh, inline resources are all about. Here we have an AAPT Atra. And what this is doing is where previously we specified a drawable in the animated vector element above, this allows us to inline one of those attributes. So we had this attribute called drawable and we're inlining it here. So rather than declaring it with a reference to an external file, we include this ATRA here, and if oh, my laser pointer doesn't show up on the, the screen, that's why it's not shown. Uh, so this drawable, that's the name of the parameter that we've moved out of here. And rather than just having a reference to another drawable file, the body of this is actually that draw the contents of that drawable file that we used earlier. So it's doing exactly the same thing, it just moves it in here rather than having it in a separate file. What actually happens at compile time is AAPT actually splits this out into a separate file anyway. So what we get at the end is identical but if you want to organize your code into single files you can doing it do it using this technique and this will work for any resource where you can use a, uh, uh, a reference to another resource you can just bring it in line just using this same thing uh, there is a gotcha with it uh, that it uh, because it's splitting things out into separate files at compile time if you have duplication here, so say you have uh, a, uh, a, a, the same animator that you use all over the place and you bring it in line, each of those files that contain an inline version will create a separate file, a separate copy of that, so you will get a lot of duplication. So it might bloat your APK a little bit, but they're not that big. But it's just worth knowing. So if you really are going to, to get your APA, APK size down as small as possible, you might want to avoid this. The other th thing worth considering is if you have got a lot of duplication, it might be worthwhile to have it as a single file because if you need to tweak it once, then you get the same change everywhere. Um, the other thing here, you can mix and match. So down at the bottom here, I do have an animator being referenced uh, in the, the target attribute at the bottom there. So you can still have a reference there and still have an inline as well. So in summary, uh, these were added into AAPT version 2.2. They allow you to bundle multiple resources into a single file. They get broken up during the build. and you get limited auto-suggest. Now this is a bug more with Android Studio than anything. So where you can type stuff in and you get auto-complete, that's not going to happen so anywhere near as well when you're using inline resources. And as I said, you can get this APK bloat. Um, now, so the next thing we'll talk about is gradients. Um, those of you that are, are lucky enough to work with designers um, will know that designers love gradients. <laughs> <laughs> um, gradients uh, are, can be used in really, really subtle ways, even in uh, nice sort of flat material design. Uh, a, a subtle gradient can just uh, give something uh, a, just a, a more natural feel. Um, there is actually a really subtle gradient in the background of my slides that you probably don't notice but I know it's there, and 
it makes me feel good knowing it's there. Um, and it's the sort of thing that if it wasn't there, they would look a little bit starker, even though it's not noticeable. And this is why um, designers love uh, gradients, because you can use them in these subtle ways. And when vectors first came out, they were, oh great, we can start giving you SVG, and well, oh, great, now and then. You get these SVGs and they've got gradients in them. You have to go back and say, um, look, I'm really sorry, uh, but Vector Drawable doesn't support gradients. And their faces drop. <laughs> oh, the humanity. I don't like seeing sad designers. It's nice to keep our designers happy. Um, and luckily, gradients have now been added to vector drawables. And we'll have a look a, a little bit about how to use them. So here's a square. Now, if you're lucky here, you might see the subtle gradient when compared to the very white square there. Um, just saying. Um, and so there are a number of different types of gradients that we could draw. The simplest form, now please forgive me, I'm not trying to be a subtle designer here. <laughs> if I try to be subtle, as you can see from the background, you won't see it. <laughs> so I've gone for quite bold gradients so you can clearly see the, the transition. If you show these to a designer and he looks, or he or she looks uh, quite ill, then I'm not going for artistic merit here. I'm going for, for clarity. So this is a linear gradient. So we start at one color at the top, in which case this is just a, 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 a we, I'm just altering the uh, opacity here. And then we go to a different color at the bottom. And this is implemented using a gradient element. Now here you may see the method in my madness of why I explained inline complex resources just before this, because you can embed these into a vector drawable as an in inline complex resource. Or you can create them as a separate resource file and reference them, but they, these fit really nicely by inlining. And to draw a linear gradient, we give it a type of, surprisingly, linear. Then we create our start color. So we give it a start x and y coordinate, which the coordinate space in vectors starts top left. So here at 0, 0. And we give it a start color, which here is actually the green, but with an opacity of 0, so it's completely transparent. Then we create the end point. So this it has uh, just the y coordinate change, so it's vertically below the start point. And here we have the same color value, but with an, uh, an alpha of ff, so it's completely transparent. So when we draw that, we get this transition. Now it's the direction of this line that controls the direction of the uh, gradient. So it doesn't matter where within the shape or even outside the shape we actually draw this line is the fact that one point is vertically above the other that controls it. So it doesn't matter what the actual coordinates we use are, anywhere in there will actually create the same uh, gradient. Uh, and if we actually just change the end x coordinate there, uh, we will draw a vertical, uh, sorry, a diagonal line and that will render as a diagonal gradient. So just by changing the direction of that, that, that line, we've got really fine control over that. That's great. Second type of uh, gradient, a radial. So a radial starts from our start color at the center point and then grows out to our end color. And this is defined, it's actually even slightly simpler than the linear. We give it a type of radial. We give it a center x and a center y. So this is the point where our start color will be. And 
In this case, it's right dead center of our square, but we can offset this and move it around just by changing the X and Y coordinates. And then we give a gradient radius. The radius is an imaginary circle, and as we hit the radius, that's where we'll hit the end color. So you can see from here that in the corners, which are outside the radius, we're actually just getting a uniform color. So at the point where we hit the radius, we just got uniform color from there outwards. So if we actually wanted to completely fill that circle, such as that, we'd actually need to change the radiance using a bit of trigonometry will actually give us a radius of 70.71 there instead of the 50 that we had before. And then hopefully you can see, because of the color of the, the border on there, we are just hitting that color right in the very corners. But in the midpoints, we're, we're still on the way to the end color. Third and final type of gradient is a sweep gradient. And this draws a sweep around the center point. Um, it's probably, you just seen how it's done with that reveal animation, that it starts at one color, and then it's like, you know, drawing a, a circle trans transitioning from one color to the next, uh, to the end color. And so you do get this uh, sort of uh, hard edge between the, the start color and the end color because it comes back to the start point. And this is even easier still. You give it a sweep, you give it a start color and end color, and then you, ah, sorry, I went too far there. Apologies. Uh, uh, and you just uh, have the, the center X and Y and a start and end color. This doesn't actually look that great. What's better is where you try and get it to uh, sweep through a mid value and back to an end value. So something a bit more like this, and I'll give you a warning now to, so you can see how the sweep is drawn. Here it comes. And in this case, we're going to the end color at the halfway point and then back to the start color again. So it gives us quite a nice smooth uh, transition and you can get sort of metal cone effects and that kind of stuff using this and the way you can do this is rather than just having a start and end color you can set items within there now each of these items this is effectively setting a start color you give it an offset and the offset is in the range from zero at the start to one at the end any fractional value between those will give a, a, a value somewhere in the middle. And then you give it the color that's needed. So in this case, it's our transparent green. Offset of 0 0.5. So that's the halfway point. We're at our full green color, our, our, trans our, our opaque green. And then at 1, which is the end point, we're back to our transparent color again. So that's how we get this transition from white to green, back to white again. And you can add as many of these as you like, so you can have a lot of different steps within the gradient. So you can create a full rainbow color all around this sweep gradient if you want by going through all the colors in turn. Um, and it's really powerful because if you think you can change these offsets, so just by changing this 0 0.5 in the middle, you can bring this back and move it round, and it's really quite fine-grained control. And this same t technique can be used on all of the other types as well. So you're not just uh, tied to a, a simple start to finish. You've got really quite complex control for what's actually quite a simple API. So it's really, really powerful stuff. And in the majority of cases, these will come directly in from uh, SVG except there is a but here <laughs> sweep is not supported uh, if you go into sketch for those of you that have sketch or if you don't have sketch and you have a friendly designer that has sketch you can get them to create you a sweep gradient in uh, sketch get them to export it to SVG and then try and import it and you'll see nothing and that's not because of any bugs in Android Studio. 
any problems with vector drawable or any problems with sketch is because SVG path data doesn't support sweep gradients. So you've got this intermediate format that we're using that just doesn't support this. So if you do have a designer who wants to use sweep gradients, you're going to need to sit down with them, understand how they want to use it, and you'll need to reconstruct these program uh, in XML. Um, but hopefully, now you understand all about them, so it'll be, yeah, I can do that. That English fella taught us how. Um, and now we will have happy designers again, because they can have their gradients. So these were added in API 24. So there was a lot of, of this got fixed up in ADA, API 24. As I said, sweep isn't supported. And they were added to the support library. So. <laughs> And if we use the support library, we have smiling designers, <laughs> which makes us happy as well. So a lot of this has been sort of some pretty dry theory. Um, just to finish off, going to give you sort of something a bit more practical and a bit more, uh, hopefully, uh, quite lighthearted, but maybe gives you an idea of how these things can be used. Uh, I've been working night and day trying to get these slides done. <laughs> and I'm quite pleased with that, even if I say so myself. I quite like it. Um, yeah, I'm going to look at it a bit more. I like it. Um, but we'll show you how it's done. So firstly, we have a background colour. So night to day, obviously at daytime we have a light blue sky. And we use an object animator. I'm not going to go into details of object animators. I hope you understand how uh, object animators work. But here we're just animating a fill color using a color type. And you just give this two color values, and it animates between the two. So here we have a light, view, a light blue in the value from, and a darker blue in the value to. And this actually is. No, that one's correct, sorry. Uh, there is a bug in one of these slides with a, a color value, which I haven't had a chance to fix. Um, so this just gives us our background color transitions from light to dark blue. Um, now, you will notice throughout these, if you look at the duration, they're 500 milliseconds. So this should be running in, uh, about half a second. I've actually slowed these down because they're easier to... Uh, they're less likely to cause seizures if I uh, <laughs> slow them down. And, uh, and also, they're, they're just easier to, to see some of the other animations if they're a little bit slower. Um, so that is a, a tip for when you're working on animations. Sometimes just slow them down, which you can either do by tweaking the, the uh, duration, or you can go into developer settings and you can uh, actually control uh, a scale factor on animation speeds. Uh, for the whole system and you can slow all the system down and uh, if you really want to, to mess with someone's brain uh, if you get hold of their phone unlocked enable developer options and go and slow down all the animations to 10 times their normal size <laughs> they will hate you um, but you didn't hear that from me <laughs> uh, so the next thing we draw a line we draw a yellow line um, you, lines are really easy to draw in SVG um, un, or using SVG path data. Uh, I'm not going to explain how to draw a line. Uh, check out a video of my previous talk where I showed you how to do some basic uh, squares and things, and you'll know how to draw a line. But this is just drawing a line between two points. And we can animate this using what's called a trim path. A trim path is it allows you to just draw a part of the line. So we've defined the line, that doesn't change, but what we're telling this is to just draw a section of it. And once again, we animate the value in between zero and one. Zero will draw none of the line, and one will draw all of the line. And by animating between those, it gives, you, gives us this, uh, appear, uh, uh, this feel that the line is being drawn. And so you can see how this is uh, syncing up with the background. So this line is drawing and undrawing just by changing that trim path value. 
Um, and this can be used really, really nicely if you've got a much more complex shape, say the outline of a map. Uh, Romain Guy uh, did something a few years back now, before vectors came along actually, where he had some outlines of uh, the US states and he uses uh, used a trim path to actually uh, show these as though they were being drawn in real time and it's a really, really uh, nice effect that you can get. But we're just using it in a really, really simple form here. But it's a, a powerful thing you can do with Trimpa. So the next thing we do is we're going to change the colour as well. So here we're just changing the stroke colour, which is the colour that the, the, this line is going to be drawn. And we're going between uh, the value from is this yellow um, with an alpha of uh, FF, which is fully, tra uh, fully opaque. And then we're going to the, the value 2 is actually a grey. And this ties in with the colour we're, we're going to use from the sun to moon in a, a little while. But we also change the opacity. So as well as this transitioning to grey, it's also fading away. So you, you're maybe not seeing the grey in there, but you're going to get... It, it's just going to fit better with the, the colour changing of the moon when we come to do that. So if we actually shrink this to its actual size it's one of the rays of the sun. And we give it uh, 11 siblings. <laughs> and if we put those into a group, uh, group is just a, another element type in SVG, and it allows you to uh, group things together, as the name suggests, but then you can perform various animations on the group as a whole. So the first thing that we can do with this is we can just give this slight rotation. So this is just a 30 degree rotation around the center point. And because we're rotating the group rather than all the individual rays, they all just move as one, which is, makes our life a lot easier. Then we can apply a scale. So what this is going to do, uh, the, you need to apply this both to the, the X and Y uh, directions to get this to, to grow in both directions at once. This is just the scale X here, but the scale Y is identical to this, only the property name there is scale Y rather than scale X. Um, and what we're doing here is we're scaling from a value of 1.0, which is the size that it's rendered at, to 1.4. So we're just growing it by about 40%. And as it if we combine that with this rotation, we get this sort of slightly spiral out from the center type effect that you can see there. And so if we then combine this with the trim path and the color change, you can see how we've got this effect where we sort of, sort of dissolve these rays and they sort of uh, disappear off into the night. Um, so we're most of the way there, aren't we? we just got the, the sun and moon thing to go. Yeah, this is where it gets a little trickier. Um, how we draw a circle. Um, circles aren't that difficult to draw using SVG path data, but sections of circles and being then able to animate them require a little bit more work. So we'll cover a little bit about how some of these commands work, how to draw some of these curves. So the first thing we have, this first command, is move. <coughs> so if you imagine a canvas and you have a pen or pencil in your hand, move will actually move it to a position without the pen touching the canvas. So you're just moving to a, a specific position without drawing anything. And the yellow dot is the point we've just moved to. So that's where we're going to start drawing if we draw something now. So the next command is a bit more difficult. This is the arc command. Now, for those that are a bit rusty on their maths, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm English, I say maths, and uh, <laughs> we, we pronounce it as a plural, whereas I know you say math. Um, and <laughs> one of those uh, little cultural differences. So forgive me if I, um, if I say maths. You know what I mean, hopefully. Um, an arc is a part of a circle. So if you imagine drawing a circle, 
a circle itself is an arc, but any portion of that circle, you can draw a subsection of it, and that's still an arc. And so arc allows us to draw a section of the circle. Now, if you imagine our sun and moon shape, the sun is a perfect circle, and the moon is like a crescent, but there is an area that's common between them. And we're going to use an arc to draw that common area. Um, you can take my word for it, but the arc is uh, anti-clockwise 280 degrees of the circle. And we use the arc car command to draw that. Now this is just uh, looks like a random string of numbers, so let's try and explain them. And I'm going to explain them by starting at the wrong end. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Um, the last two arguments there is the end position. So we've given 143.3 uh, by 122.7, the x and y coordinates of that endpoint. Uh, so that's where we're, we're going to draw the arc to. And the remainder actually controls what that arc's going to look like and the exact path it's going to follow. But it's going to draw something between those two points. We're going to jump back to the beginning again. Um, now, sorry if this seems a bit random, but I'm hoping that by going to things in a more logical way than they're positioned in the command itself, I can hopefully explain what they're doing a little better than just trying to go through them sequentially. The 49 by 49 is the uh, x radius and y radius of the circle. Um, now, there's both an x and y radius because as well as drawing circles or arcs of circles, we can all also draw ellipses, which are ovals. And they're uh, a, a non... Uh, they don't have the same x and y dimensions, whereas a circle does. A circle is purely symmetrical. So 49 by 49 is the radius of the circle that we want to draw between those two points. And there are actually two circles on that canvas of a radius 49 by 49 that pass through both those circles. You don't have to take my word for it. We'll prove it. Uh, I'm not going to go into the complex maths about it, but... If you draw a circle around each of those points, as those as the, uh, of the center, of size 49 by 49, like this, you will see those two circles overlap, or they cross at two points, those two points. If you now draw a circle of 49 by 49 around each of those two points, you can see both of those circles pass through our start and end point. If you want to go away and actually look at the maths behind it, please feel free. But hopefully a little graphical demonstration there, you can sort of uh, trust me on this one. Yes? Uh, can I ask a quick question? I'm just wondering about the points. Um, when you're usually doing vector drawables and you're, you're, you're trying to make your shapes, how are you getting your is there something else you're using, or do you draw it first and then...? Um, what you do before you start, um, if you find a copy of my previous talk, I talk about the coordinate system on there. and You basically define it yourself. You can define how, what the size of your canvas is. So this happens to be, I think, um, uh, a 200 by 200 canvas that I defined here. Um, and so I'm just drawing within a 200 by 200 space. But it's, it, you can control it, and these uh, coordinates are something you're in full control of, and it's completely transparent to the outside world. So you declare your width and height to the outside world using DPs, and that's what gets measured. But what you're using internally is completely intrinsic to what you're doing and you don't need to worry about it you just need to to stay consistent with what you've declared um but yeah uh it yeah it was a difficult one because when, when i wrote this i didn't know who'd seen my previous talk and who hasn't but you if you uh, youtube it or search for it it's been recorded at a few uh conferences um so these are these two uh circles that can pass through there. And 
The remainder is picking bits of these two circles uh, that we'll use to draw our arc. The next parameter we actually can ignore, uh, which is nice. The re what this parameter does is if we have an ellipse, which is where we have a different x and y radius, so we have an oval, this allows us to rotate it so we can uh, get uh, uh, different rotations of that uh, uh, arc. But in this case, because we're using a circle, you rotate a circle, it's still identical to what you've done. So we just put zero in here. So that one we can ignore, which is nice. So we've only got two left, and they're just zeros and ones. So we have the two circles here. Um, and I'm going to jump sort of back to a different coordinate. This, uh, the one just before the end point controls which of these circles we're interested in. So this one, if we set this to a 1, it's going to select the, the uh, brighter circle there. But if we set it to 0, it's going to select this one. Now, this is the one we want, so a value of 0 there. The final parameter, which is the one there, this selects which of these arcs. There's two arcs here. There's this short arc, which we can select using a 0. But if we specify 1, we get this arc. And that is our anti-clockwise 280 degree arc for around those parameters. Now, I know there's quite a lot to take in and there's a bit of maths involved, but hopefully you can see roughly how you go about creating that shape. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I can now see how the rest of this is done. When we have a sun, we can select the other arc on that circle. And when we have um, a crescent moon, we can actually select a concave arc from the other circle. Yeah, we could, but then we can't actually animate it in the way we want. So instead, we're going to use a cubic bezier. Um, cubic bezier is a different way of drawing a curve. Uh, there's also a quadratic bezier, which uh, I'm not going to uh, go into. A cubic bezier will, again, will explain a little as we go graphically. And it will become apparent why this is valuable here in a moment. But it's worth mentioning that a cubic bezier will not accurately draw uh, an arc or a part of a circle. It will not be mathematically accurate. So technically, uh, it's not part of a circle but we can get a close approximation. And the approximation we're going to get, I think, is easily good enough to fuel, fool the human eye. And that's all we need to do here. We don't need mathematical accuracy, but we need it to look like a circle. Um, and uh, how we go about this, so we, declare, we, we draw a cubic bezier using the C command. And again, the start point is where we finish drawing. So where I said earlier we did a move, we then drew that arc, and our pen is now where we finish drawing. So if we draw something now, it's going to draw from the end point. The final two uh, coordinates here in this command, it, once again, is the end point that we want to draw the arc to. So the start point is the old end point of the previous command and now the end point we actually want to close this circle so the end point is 150 which if you look up at the move command that's where we started and so we're actually going to draw this final bit of curve between those two so that's two of the uh, the coordinates you can see another two pairs there uh, th and they are x and y coordinates so two points so how this is drawn, if you imagine, we talked earlier about imagine we start somewhere and we start walking. The first of these two pairs of coordinates is a control point for the start. Um, and what this control point does is, if you imagine we start at the start point, 
we start walking and we start walking directly towards the that control point now as we get move off of the start there's going we start well the, the start point will have less influence on us and this other coordinate which is the end control point will start to influence and the further along the path we get the more influence the end control point will have and the less influence the start control point will have so that by the time we're actually approaching the end point we will be walking directly away from the end control point if you can sort of envisage that you can see that as we go around there it will pull us back between the points the final Z there is what's called close path, and that's just going to make sure that we close the uh, where we ended this to where we started, so that when we fill, we don't get anything leaking out. And it's always just good practice to do that, even though technically you don't need to these days because uh, the rendering system sort of handles it quite well. Now the reason for doing it this way is. If you think of the, the delta between this uh, circle and the crescent moon, we just want to animate that uh, section of the curve. And the start and end points aren't changing. It's not as though those two points, it's the curve in the middle that's changing. So what we can actually do is do a path animation and all we're doing is changing the positions of those control points. And so you can see how we get this really quite nice smooth animation between the circle and the crescent. So once again, sorry it was if it's been a bit sort of bombarding information, but if you take the time to learn this stuff, you can do some really quite nice stuff with it. And it is downhill from here. There's no more heavy lifting <laughs> needed. Um, the first thing we do is we do this color change. So if we fill this, this is where there's a bug. Uh, this value two here, it shouldn't have transparency there. The first two digits should actually be FF and I need to fix this slide. Um, but this is just uh, doing a color another uh, color animation between the yellow and this gray color and now we can combine it all together we put the sun uh, the, the sun moon shape in the same group as the rays and so it gets the same slight rotation and it gets the same slight grow because you'll see the, the 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 sun actually grows slightly into the moon and so none of these techniques, well, maybe apart from some of the path data stuff, is that complex. But it's just layering them up uh, and just uh, uh, mixing quite simple animations. You can create some really quite effective uh, results. And that's about it for now. Um, we, we will uh, maybe do the, the, uh, the little elevator thing if everyone's uh, in for it and uh, got some time. Um, just before, I'll, I'll answer a few questions in case there are any, but I will just preempt one uh, just before we finish. Um, and that is, um, unfortunately, no. I'm not going to share my slides. Um, there is a reason that I'm not going to share my slides. Um, it's because there aren't any. Um, I've been presenting from a pixel book and on there it's running an app I wrote um, and it's a custom application and all of the slides on here are Android layouts. Um, all of the animations you've seen were animated vectors rendering in real time and all of the vector drawables that we showed on there were actual real vector drawables. So the gradients were actually the code that you were seeing there and the animation at the end was rendering real time. And so there are no slides, um, but there's a, a series on my blog post, a series of blog posts which explains a bit about how the app works and it's open source. And hopefully if the tweets have been working, 
Uh, does anyone know if the tweets worked? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Bella. Um, you should have received a link that uh, both the blog post series and a deep link into the source code of all the slides and the animations. So, yeah, there's no slides, but if you want to look at the layouts, you can. If you want to go and grab the vector drawables, so if you want to grab the sun and moon and pick it apart and play with it and start tweaking parameters and uh, see how it works, and yeah, you're more than welcome. It's, uh, it's um, open source, it's Apache 2 licensed, so do with it as you will. Um, but that's it, unless anyone has any questions. Yes? Um, it's not totally relevant, but is there a way to interact with the vector drawables? Like, if there are five circles and I touch them, is there any way for me to know which one I'm interacting with? In um, what you mean, which path element? Not really. Okay, well, a vector drawable you would generally put into an image view or a background of a view or something like that. And for touch control, you would need to handle that through the view itself. So you would get the idea of the view. Um, you wouldn't necessarily get individual parts of a vector drawable within that. But what you could do is actually, if you ha create a number of vectors uh, of the same size and place them one or two, uh, above the other inside uh, a layout, have one handle the touch, but then you could have others that animate in response to that touch event. So that's probably the easiest way to do it. You can start an animation at any time you like, so you could do that in response to a touch event. Uh, we I got one short one that might lead into a longer one. So <laughs> No, it goes farther back. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know, but I think it, it's pretty much all the support libraries are going back to at least 16 now. Um, so if you're doing MinSDK less than 16, you're probably doing it wrong. But, um, um, but yeah, it, it's pretty good. Uh, you, you might struggle a little bit with uh, some older devices um, and just the, the, the graphics processing and memory they have to load complex paths, but if you're keeping your path data reasonably simple, you should be okay. When yes. you're doing the odd even, even odd thing, yeah. and you had, a, you had the dot over on the right-hand side, and you're showing how it would like intersect, it would be on the, the one side in yeah. the donut, right? It would go over, yeah. and then come back over. Is yeah. it re-rendering twice, or is it is it optimizing under the hood? Uh, no, it's not. It's uh, that was just really uh, an example of how the the algorithm works, so a human could understand it. Um, okay. a, a machine has a, a specific algorithm for doing it, um, but it was just trying to explain how the rule applies. If you if we can understand that, um, then we can understand how to fix it. So that was the purpose of that. It's, it wasn't saying that it's doing all of this in, in those calculations. It was just proving that it doesn't matter which direction you move, it, you'll still get uh, uh, the same result in terms of whether the pixel should be colored or not. Is yes. your presentation tool open source, or do you have plans to? Yeah, the, the whole thing is open sourced. Um, the, I have a light version and a, a private version. Uh, the light version is what's open source. Uh, the private version uh, has so a few extra stuff in, uh, like the live tweets, because it's a pain to try and uh, release that and expose all my uh, API keys for Twitter, APIs and things like that. Um, so that's the main reason, and there's some really horrible code that I don't so, want to share in them. <laughs> so, uh, follow up to that, so that when you transition to something, that triggers the tweet to go up? Yeah, I, I'm basically I have a, a custom layout, um, and I have an attribute on there that contains a tweet, and so when that layout is loaded, the attribute, the presence of the attribute triggers the, the tweet to go up. Uh, so if you actually go in and look at the source, you will see the, the tweet, and the the, the tweet uh, attributes there but you just won't see the code that actually picks those up and tweets. Um, so, yeah. Um, so we've been using body for our designers. Yeah. After a fact, we're considering body for our architectures and some wonderful stuff. 
Yeah, um, Lottie is great. Um, uh, I think it's a, a, a wonderful tool. The reason I don't really cover it that much is it's not really... Um, uh, because it's using After Effects, um, there is no intermediate format that us as developers can tinker with. We will get a file from uh, that we use in Lottie and that's it. If it needs tweaking, it has to go back to designers. Uh, mainly because uh, After Effects licenses are expensive. Um, so they don't generally give them to developers. Um, so, uh, you know, we get our licenses for development tools. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I've never really played with uh, Lottie that much because I haven't got uh, an After Effects license and I can't justify the cost. So, yeah. But yeah, it's va it's a valid uh, tool, and you can do wonderful things with it. But with vectors, you can get in and tinker with it. So, so one other one here with the inline vectoring. Um, yeah. My first reaction when I saw that was, all right, that's violating dry, which you kind of touched on. Yeah. And it also, you're introducing a, like a lot of extra stuff versus just say, here's your circle, kind of when you're trying to see what's going on. Yeah. With that being said, do you find yourself using that quite a bit, or is that more like, well, you can? Maybe there are certain circumstances, but generally... It, it becomes a feel thing. Uh, you, you, the more you use it, the more you just uh, instinctively know whether you should you inline or not. Um, when I'm putting these slides together, for example, there's a lot of stuff I need to inline because it, otherwise it really gets quite monstrous. I think um, because I accidentally deleted all my slides uh, a few days before I was due to fly out and had a nightmare which I won't uh, burden you all with, um, I realised that I'd wiped out uh, a total of about 250 vectors and animated vectors in the whole uh, uh, tree. So on that set of slides, there's about 250 vectors or animated vectors. Um, and that's not including some of the, uh, um, the animators as well. So there's sometimes when you've got that volume of files, Inlining does help to keep it manageable, even though you might get uh, duplication and APK bloat, to be able to go into a file and tweak something can be advantageous. And then you can realize, oh, I want to change this everywhere, and now I've got to go in and do it in every one. So yeah, pros and cons, swings and roundabouts. It's know what, you get to know what's the right approach, but there's no hard and fast rules, really.